Hi book lovers, welcome back to my channel. Bridgerton season two is finally here and I finished watching it. I've been dying for the release of the second season after watching and loving season one, which featured the first Bridgerton couple, Simon and Daphne. I finished watching the second season on Saturday and I've been trying to collect my thoughts on it because I do have quite a lot of them. There were so many things happening in season two, so this video is gonna be my review and my thoughts on everything that happened. I will go into spoilers for the show and the books a little bit later in the video, but for now these are my spoiler-free thoughts. For some background on the Bridgerton show, if you didn't know, it is based on the Bridgerton book series by Julia Quinn. It's a historical romance series set during the Regency era, it's set in the early 1800s, and the series is a pretty classic in the historical romance subgenre. If anyone is interested, I do have a review of the entire book series as well as a review of Bridgerton season one. Season two is based on book two, The Viscount Who Loved Me, which is Anthony and Kate's romance. Anthony is the oldest of the Bridgerton siblings and he became the Viscount after the death of his father. He has a lot of duty and responsibility on his shoulders and after his heartbreak from season one, he's finally decided that he's on the hunt for a wife, but he wants a marriage without love. And he settles on Kate's sister Edwina as his choice. Kate's name in the books is Kate Sheffield, but they changed her to Kate Sheffield Sharma in the show. She's of Indian descent in the show, which I'm more than happy about. They also changed up Anthony's mutton chops. He had some serious mutton chops in season one, but I actually didn't mind it. Jonathan Bailey rocked those mutton chops. He's one of the few people who could probably actually pull them off, but in the second season, they shaved it. I mean, it still looks fine. I honestly don't have a preference, but it was just an interesting choice that they chose to take off the mun chops. For an adaptation of An Enemies to Lovers romance, I thought the show did a pretty great job of creating this banter and all the barbs between our main couple. You can tell how much Kate and Anthony absolutely hate each other, which I was really looking forward to seeing on screen. Sadly though, even though I think they did the enemies part well, overall I didn't actually love this as much as as I wanted to. The first season was five out of five stars and this one just wasn't as good. Like I instantly fell in love with season one right from the very first episode, but here it took me a little bit to actually get invested. I struggled with this one a bit. I wanted the show, I wanted the season to focus more on the main couple. I wanted it to focus on Anthony and Kate, but there's just so many outside plots that are happening that kind of overshadowed the romance for me. There's all these plot lines with the younger Bridgertons, the Featheringtons, the Queen, Lady Whistledown, Penelope, and it's not like I didn't enjoy any of those plots, but I really did want more of just Kate and Anthony because that's our main couple. The visuals and cinematography was also surprisingly disappointing. Like I was absolutely blown away from season one, like all the gorgeous settings, the dresses, the fireworks, the balls. It was just stunning. But here, I don't know why it felt really toned down and just not as visually stunning. So that wow factor from season one was kind of lost in season two. And also I wasn't in love with the music here either. I did, however, love the Material Girl rendition, but the wrecking ball scene was not exactly what I was hoping for. And honestly, the biggest disappointment for me here in the second season was just how much they changed from the book. Season one was pretty faithful to the Duke and I, so I'm so surprised by how much things changed in the second season, how much they just throughout the book here and just did what they wanted with the characters and with the stories. There were some key pivotal moments that I was looking forward to seeing from the books, like the thunderstorm scene where Kate hides under a desk and the bee sting and the marriage of convenience, but a lot of that was changed and some of them just didn't even happen at all. And instead of having these key pivotal moments from the books that everyone really loves, they added some plots that I just wasn't really a fan of. They turned the show into a love triangle between Anthony, Kate, and Edwina, even though that never really happened in the book. And they took this love triangle way farther than I expected or even wanted. I absolutely hated that Kate was not just Anthony's second choice, but his third choice behind Sienna 
and Edwina and they just did Kate so dirty here. My favorite character who didn't annoy me at all was Newton or Corgi. I mean anytime he showed up on screen I was just smiling so hard because he's so freaking adorable. I also really like the Queen's character this season a lot more than I did in season one because I was just kind of confused by her character in the previous season but here she's just really entertaining. She has an interesting storyline where she's kind of going head to head with Lady Whistledown and she's got a lot of depth to her character like her romance, her love story with the king, King George. So there were still some things that I enjoyed but overall I'm just really sad that I didn't love this one as much as I wanted to. The vibes were so different from the book and from what I was expecting and even different from season one too which was disappointing. I wanted a fun and lighthearted enemies to lovers romance and it started off that way but it kind of just snowballed and became super dramatic. It also wasn't as hot as season one which was another major disappointment. I think we saw more of Anthony naked with other women than with Kate herself so what's up with that? The season just felt really long and dragged out like I devoured season one. I could not get enough here but while I was watching season two I was like I can't believe there's still more. So the pacing wasn't the best, it wasn't as steamy as I wanted, and a lot of the characters became really frustrating. Those are my main gripes and the reason why I can't give this anything but three out of five stars. And now for the spoilery part of this video, I'm going to be breaking down each of the eight episodes in the season. There will 100% be spoilers for both seasons, season one and season two, and I also will be spoiling some things that happened in the books. So if you have not watched it yet, if you haven't read the books yet, I would not watch this part just yet. So let's start off with episode one, capital R Rake, which is such a great episode title. This episode might be my favorite of the eight episodes. I'm not too sure, but I just really had a fun time with it. It was a good start to the season. It wasn't like the best like the previous season. That first episode was absolutely beautiful, but this one was still really enjoyable and really fun. It opens up with the Bridgerton family. Of course it has to open up with the entire Bridgerton family because Eloise is about to make her debut for the first time. Lady Whistledown has been a little quiet until now, which means Penelope is back to her writing. She's back to being Lady Whistledown. I thought it was pretty interesting that we actually get to see more of Penelope's background being Lady Whistledown, like her going to the printing press, working with the printers. I will say I'm still not entirely happy that we got the reveal at the end of season one about Penelope being Lady Whistledown because it's not so supposed to be revealed until like book four until her own romance but I understand why they had to because it's not like anyone couldn't have figured it out by reading the books. And then Anthony, our capital R rake, is looking for a wife and I thought the montage with him interviewing all the eligible ladies was hilarious. He's going through his list of ladies, his list of questions to ask them, and just trying to make it as unemotional as possible because he does not want to fall in love. Even though I'm not like the biggest fan of Rake Heroes, I do appreciate that he's a little bit different from the typical one because he doesn't think that he's not capable of love because he is, he knows he is, he's fallen in love before, which I'm still annoyed by. But the reason why he doesn't want love in his marriage is because he doesn't want to go through the pain or he doesn't want to put his wife through the pain of what his parents went through. We do get to see a couple of naked butt shots here, which is pretty much the extent of all the steaminess that we get for like seven episodes and I actually think that this is the most naked that we see Anthony throughout the entire season. Like he doesn't even get this naked for Kate which is disappointing. Kate and Anthony's first meeting in the show was pretty fun but very different from the book. I actually like the show version more just because there's a little bit more excitement with it because in the books they just literally meet at a ball or introduced to each other at a ball but here they end up racing each other on their horses so you kind of get a feel for this sense of competition between them of them just going head to head throughout the entire season. And then just like in season one, we do have the scene with all the ladies being presented to the queen, Eloise 
almost gets presented until Lady Whistledown interrupts them. But the whole point of the queen character is sort of so she can choose the diamond of the season, like the most eligible lady of that season. If you've read the books, then you know that there's no actual queen character here. And I'm actually not too sure how the books end up choosing the diamond of the season. Like, is it just a collective decision by the ton? But Edwina, Kate's sister, is chosen to be the diamond, which means Anthony needs to court her so that he can marry her. Something a little bit different from the books as well is that Lady Danbury is sponsoring the Sharmas in the show. The Sharmas have returned from India after being away for a long time. Mary, Kate's stepmom, had a whole scandal when she married Kate's dad because Kate's dad was not up to her family standards. So in the show, the reason why they're able to debut into society is thanks to Lady Danbury, but in the books, it's because the Sheffields, Kate and her family have saved up for like five years in order to go to London. They were really poor and just couldn't afford separate seasons. So Kate and Edwina debuted at the same time. In the books, Kate is actually 21, I believe. And in the show, they aged her up to 26. I'm not entirely sure of the reason of this, maybe to make Kate even more of a spinster than she is in the books, but I did have a lot of fun with this first episode. It was really entertaining and it was just great seeing all the Bridgertons again and being back in this world. It's hard not to compare though, but it just wasn't as perfect as the first episode from season one. Episode two is off to the races. We're getting deeper into Anthony's courtship of Edwina, but Kate is telling her that she has to refuse because she overheard Anthony saying that he would never marry for love and love is exactly exactly what Kate wants for Edwina. Kate is an incredibly protective or almost more like overprotective mother figure to Edwina. And at first it's like really sweet. She's a great sister, but then it gets to be a lot. Like Anthony, Kate feels this heavy responsibility for Edwina and her stepmom Mary. She feels this need to take care of them, to plot to save their family, even though she's not the parent. Although I do love the background to the Sheffields and Sharmas. The show adds a lot more depth to Mary and her family than the books ever did. And then our third Bridgerton son Colin is back from his trip from Greece and this boy came back with the hatchiest beard ever. I can see how they tried to like make him a little bit older, appear more mature with this beard, but it just was not happening. His actor just has such a strong baby face and also the beard wasn't full enough either, so this beard was not cutting it. Thankfully though, he doesn't actually keep this patchy beard for the entire season. I think it's just for this episode. But yes, Colin returns home after only a year away. In the books, he's gone for several years. In the book timeline, his romance doesn't happen until 10 years after book two, The Viscount Who Loved Me. So they fast forwarded this thing like crazy, which kind of does make sense. It's not like they could really age up the actors either, or at least for the older actors. But yes, this season definitely felt like a setup for his and Penelope these romance. Penelope is still friend zone to hell and Colin is still hung up on Marina which I was surprised by but I will say he's hung up on a way that he wants her to be happy with where she is. Like he's just a really sweet and nice guy. I actually way prefer the non-rake heroes in this series like Colin and Benedict. These sweet good guy heroes who aren't rakes, who don't have mistresses or sleep with a ton of women like Simon and Anthony did. I'm not gonna lie, I actually did not like Anthony and Simon that much in their own books. I only really like them in the show mainly because of their actors, Jonathan Bailey and Reggae John Page. So I do really appreciate Colin being such a good guy, although Benedict is a little different from his book character, but I still like him. And then for some reason we get Penelope being way too obvious about being Lady Whistledown. I feel like I didn't actually need to see this on the screen because I would rather prefer having Lady Whistledown be the secretive and mysterious character that she is supposed to be. So there were a lot of moving parts to the second episode, which I didn't hate necessarily, but I also did want more of just Anthony and Kate. And then episode three is called A Bee in Your Bonnet, which I only recently found out is an actual saying. I think it's more of a saying in the UK, but it just means like something super annoying. And based on this title, I was also expecting, or at least hoping for the bee scene from the book. And we 
did get it, but more like we only got half of the scene, which is a really strange choice. But we do finally get some flashbacks of the Bridgertons back when their father Edmund was alive. The episode opens up with Edmund's death scene, just like the book opens up. The prologue is this death scene. Edmund gets stung by a bee, has this awful allergic reaction, and dies from it. In the books, it was Eloise that actually saw this happen and saw him die, but in the show, they had Anthony be with Edmund while he died. I didn't mind this choice though because it just emphasized how much trauma Anthony went through. Like not only did Anthony have to become the new Viscount and take care of not just his siblings but his mother too, he literally saw his father die in front of him. I actually teared up in this scene. Like the show nailed the pain and the heartbreak going on here. I teared up when Edmund was dying in Violet's arms, in his wife's arms, and then he like lifted his hand to touch her face right before he passed. And I was just like, ugh. So, so emotional. It was such a small moment, but you could just feel how much love there was between Edmund and Violet. And I believe this is the first time that we get to see Aubrey Hall, the Bridgerton estate, because they've always really stayed in London. They never really traveled to Aubrey Hall because that's where Edmund died. Pretty sure we didn't see it in season one, but I could be wrong. But the Bridgertons do host like this gathering at Aubrey Hall. They invite the Sharmas first before everyone else. I do feel like this episode might be a lot of people's favorites because we do get Pal Mal here. This was one of the scenes that I really, really was looking forward to from the books and it's pretty much the only scene that they were faithful to in the books, so I'm glad. The scene is like a turning point for Kate and Anthony because she finally realizes that Anthony has a lot more going on to him than she expected. It was both super fun and super emotional because we get this really bright and cheery Pal Mal scene we get to see Kate and Anthony go head to head, but then we also get these painful, painful scenes of like the past of Edmund dying, of Violet giving birth to Hyacinth, and Anthony coming into this Viscount role that he never wanted at age 18. And then I'm also glad we get more background, backstory into the reason why Anthony doesn't want to marry for love. Like at first you think it's because he got his heart broken from season one when he fell in love with Sienna, this opera singer who left him. But it's actually more along the lines of because of what happened with his parents, like the pain that Violet went through, he never wants to put his wife through that. And because of this, he almost proposes to Edwina, a woman that he does not love, that he is not growing feelings for because he's growing feelings for her sister. And I was actually terrified that he was really going to go through with this proposal. He doesn't though in this episode, but it was just a roller coaster of emotions, but I still really liked it. It was a fun episode besides, you know, the painful parts, but I mean, it's because the Bridgertons are all together. One of the funniest scenes in the season happened in this episode where Benedict gets high as fuck over this powder that Colin got from Greece. Benedict dumps all this powder because he's super nervous about getting into art school and he's just so, so high throughout the entire episode. But going back to the family as a whole, I just love how lighthearted things are whenever it's a Bridgerton scene, a Bridgerton family scene, because the actors do just a really great job at acting like a family, a real family. There are quite a lot of other things that are happening in this episode too outside of the family. Madame Delacroix, the modiste, finds out that Penelope is Lady Whistledown, which I did not expect. I did not expect anyone to find out who Lady Whistledown was. So this was a surprise, but I can see why, like of all people, to find out about Penelope and to actually help her, it's Madame Delacroix. Like she's pretty much the only person that you can think of who would be able to hear all the gossip, all the secrets from the ton and help Lady Whistledown reveal her secrets. There's a lot going on with the Featheringtons too, like the new Lord Featherington. He's finally shown up. He is the late Lord Featherington's cousin, Cousin Jack. He seems to be courting Cressida, the mean girl of the season. And I thought it was just so funny 
the drama that this caused because now Lady Featherington, Portia, she is terrified that Cousin Jack is gonna marry Cressida and kick out Lady Featherington and her daughters. And then I also thought it was hilarious that Lady Featherington tried to set up Prudence, her daughter, her oldest non-married daughter, to marry Lord Featherington. I mean, it's a little iffy just because he is her father's cousin. It's not like it was that weird back then because this sort of incest did happen. So I wasn't too grossed out about it or anything. I just took it for what it was, which was so funny. I laughed every time Prudence called him Cousin Jack. Like, oh my gosh, I'll get to marry Cousin Jack. But again, this sort of thing happened a lot in the past and I just really like the humor slant that the show gave it. And then we have the infamous B scene that happens towards the end of the episode. I was getting so excited when this was happening, when it was starting to happen because the B scene in the books was one of my favorite scenes. Anthony gets terrified that Kate is getting stung by a bee because his father died from a bee sting. In the books, Anthony literally starts sucking the venom from her chest where the bee stung her. So it looks like he's sucking on her boob. And then the moms show up, catch them in this compromising position. It's all scandalous. And then they are forced to marry. But none of this except for the bee sting and Anthony being terrified happens. I was so disappointed like the marriage of convenience didn't happen because no one caught them in the show. Anthony doesn't even get to suck on Kate's boob or at least look like he's sucking on Kate's boob. Like the whole idea of it in the books is so funny because Kate's like what the hell are you doing? Get off of me. And he's like no I have to suck the venom. I have to save your life. But sadly we miss out on all of this and I mean because no one catches them there's no marriage of convenience which means Anthony is still courting Edwina. I feel like this was kind of a turning point for the season where you're like, okay, it seems like they're really diverging from the book. And now I have no idea what they're gonna do, what they have planned for the rest of the season. On to episode four, which is called Victory. We're almost at the halfway point, but sadly I was still feeling really bummed out about how they changed the B scene. Since Kate and Anthony aren't forced to marry because they're caught in a compromising position, that's actually kind of given to another couple in the show later on. Anthony's now continuing with his courtship of Edwina, still planning on marrying her, which was not what I wanted to see. Instead of getting a wedding between Kate and Anthony here, we get a hunt at Aubrey Hall. By then, everyone has arrived at the estate and Edwina really wants her sister and her intended to get to know each other better. Kate here is an excellent shot, which is the reason why she joins the hunt, which was pretty interesting because in the books, I believe, it was Eloise who is the excellent shot. There's this really really funny scene in book five into Sir Philip with Love where the Bridgertons talk about how good Eloise is at shooting. Like the boys hate that she's so much better than them but I guess they gave that to Kate here in the show so they go hunting together and there's this really tension filled scene where Kate is aiming at the prey and then Anthony he puts his hand and body on top of her and you can just feel the chemistry between them here. Kate also shows a little bit of her sexy leg here and I was just loving the direction this was going, but then nothing really comes out of it. They do a dance together and there's so many like longing looks between them. So this was a good tension filled episode. You can just feel and tell how much Kate and Anthony want each other even though they don't want to want each other. And then there's another scene that I really wanted to see in the books, which was the thunderstorm scene. This is where Kate gets terrified that there's a thunderstorm going on because her mom, her biological mom died during a thunderstorm. In the book, Anthony finds Kate while she's terrified and takes care of her during it and it's a really big turning point for them. But we don't get that here, which is so sad. Kate and Anthony, they meet each other in the library because neither of them can fall asleep. Kate is slightly scared of thunderstorms here, but not to the extent that she was in the book. They do almost kiss here, which was really exciting, but then Daphne <laughs> cock blocks them. I really like the setup of the romance here at this point. It's like, you want them to get together and they almost get together but then something stops them. There's a lot of will they or won't they and you're just on the edge of your seat regarding the romance. As for the other characters, Eloise has somehow gotten involved with this feminist 
assembly. Colin, of all things, goes to see Marina to see how she's doing and he sees that she's doing well with her twins. I did love seeing Sir Philip though. He is one of my favorite heroes in the books. Actually, he might be my favorite hero just because his book is my top favorite. I just love to Sir Philip with love. Philip is such a sweet and quiet guy. He's literally just doing his thing, staying in his lane, taking care of his plans, and being a father to twins that aren't even his. I love the part where Colin and Philip both connect over their love of Greek plants. That part was so cute. And then for the Featheringtons, it turns out that cousin Jack doesn't actually have any money. And that's the reason why he's been courting Cressida is because she has money that he needs. But then Lady Featherington ruins this and this is where the whole compromising position happens. She forces Prudence and Cousin Jack into this compromising position that he can't escape from. Everyone sees them together and now Prudence and Cousin Jack are forced to marry. This is so funny to me because it's like this is karma biting you in the ass. Lady Featherington tried to save herself and her family and only ended up ruining them. We also learn more about this interesting inheritance scheme that the show made up. Like the reason why Kate wants Edwina to marry well, to marry someone respectable, is because if Edwina does, then she will get inheritance money from the Sheffields. And then, oh my gosh, the episode ends on such a what the hell moment because Anthony actually proposes to Edwina. Anthony proposes in front of everyone and my mouth literally dropped when this happened. I didn't expect it and I didn't want this either. I just don't know what Anthony was thinking here. He got so annoying with how much he was denying his feelings for Kate and I was feeling so bad for her here. Once he proposed, I was so over his character. I wasn't even excited to see how things would resolve anymore because it's like, almost impossible to do so, especially after a public freaking proposal. So that was one of the biggest shocks in the season and one of the biggest changes from the books. And it wasn't a good change. Episode five is An Unthinkable Fate. And there's a scene where Lady Danbury talks to Kate that pretty much says exactly what I was feeling at that point, which is that it's pretty much impossible for Anthony and Edwina to break off this engagement. There's no way they can do it without a ton of scandal on both of their families, and I just have no idea how they could possibly move on from this. I couldn't think of any situation where things would work out okay for Anthony, Kate, and Edwina, so I was feeling pretty bummed out here at this point, but it does pick up a little bit because we get some jealousy from Anthony. Everyone is promenading to pretend that things are okay between the families and Kate starts talking to another guy and Anthony is not happy about it. We get some perfect jealous looks from him. I was loving it here. And then to top it off we get the excellent Mr. Darcy moment where Anthony falls into the lake, into the pond or whatever, and he comes out with his wet shirt. He looked super hot in that scene and I was just loving the Pride and Prejudice vibes from this. There's another almost kiss between Anthony and Kate, but I was just over them by this point. The show kept building this really great tension between the main characters, but nothing has come out of it yet. But then there's this perfect line that Anthony says in this episode that perfectly encapsulates Anthony and Kate's relationship. He says, you are the bane of my existence and the object of all my desires. It's such a good line. I loved it. I don't remember this being in the book, so props to the writer who came up with it. It really stood out to me, and I'm sure everyone is obsessing over it online right now, but it's pretty much the perfect definition of Kate and Anthony's enemies to lovers relationship. So the romance picked up a little bit in this episode, but then I got really annoyed by how much Edwina seemed to actually want Anthony. I did not like that it was actually turning into a love triangle because it's never happened in the books. There were never any real feelings between Edwina and Anthony. Like, Edwina definitely didn't like Anthony as much as she does in the show. So this love triangle thing was not working for me because I just didn't like seeing the sisters going against each other. What was really interesting is that the Sheffields show up and they have dinner with the Bridgertons, but they are rude as hell. The Sheffields threw Mary out because she married someone who wasn't of their station. I so appreciated the step down that Anthony gave them, that Anthony gave the Sheffields. He was so protective of the Sharmas in the scene. You can how much he genuinely cares not just for Kate but also Edwina and Mary like he's not in love with Edwina but he still cares for her and he's definitely not about to let these rude people 
talk down to them. So that part was good, but I was not happy about the direction that Eloise's story was going. Here we get to see her get closer with this newspaper boy that she met when she was trying to track down Lady Whistledown. It really seemed like something was gonna happen between Eloise and Theo Sharp. Like she seemed to actually have a crush on him, which I was offended about on Philip's behalf. I literally didn't like Theo only because of how much I loved Philip. This was pretty much the same as to how I felt about Sienna in season one. I appreciated her character, but I hated that she was with Anthony because Kay was supposed to be Anthony's first and only love, not Sienna. So I was mad about Theo on behalf of Philip because I love Philip so, so much. But I will say the show Philip isn't exactly the best. He's just, you know, obsessed with his plants, but I still adore him. So I can see people loving the Eloise and Theo plot here, especially the ones who haven't read the books or even don't even like to Sir Philip with love. So I can see people loving Eloise and Theo together. I just wasn't one of them. And then we have Benedict and his art school thing. Honestly, that whole plot just wasn't doing anything for the show. I was actually expecting a storyline to somewhat continue from season one, like him possibly being interested in another man, in that other artist, but that was kind of forgotten in the second season. Nothing really came out of it, so. Who knows? Episode six is called The Choice, and this is the big choice that Anthony, Kate, and Edwina have to make. Is Anthony gonna go through with this wedding? Is Kate gonna stand by and let Edwina marry the man that she loves? Is Edwina gonna marry someone who doesn't love her? So it all comes down to this, right? It was a very drama-filled episode. You get really deep into the wedding preparations, which I did not expect because I didn't expect the show to really go this far with the wedding. The freaking queen is hosting Anthony and Edwina's wedding because she wants to lure out Lady Whistledown. And then we actually see Edwina walking down the aisle to Anthony and I just could not believe my eyes. It felt so so wrong. But then once everyone is up at that altar, Edwina can finally, finally see that there is actually something between her sister and her fiance. Edwina ends up running away. We get a runaway bride and she is so, so pissed at Kate. I was not a fan of how the show played out the sister relationship because they're both supposed to be super supportive and super loving to each other. It felt really out of character for Edwina to get so mad. I mean, yes, Kate was lying to her, but at the same time, I really expected Edwina to kind of give Anthony and Kate her blessing. Edwina would have wanted her sister to be happy and when she saw that Anthony and Kate were both in love with each other, she should have done something about it. I mean, maybe that's a little bit too optimistic, right? And the show needed to be more dramatic than that. But I was just super annoyed with how things played out and how much of a martyr Kate is. I was so over her character. It was like, just stop being such a martyr. She gives up her entire life, her future for Edwina and Mary, and it was just way over the top. We do finally, though, get a kiss that wasn't interrupted between Anthony and Kate, but that's literally all that we get. That's all we get in this episode. The episode six from last season was all sex, but then here we just get a measly kiss. And then outside of the wedding plot, all of a sudden, Lord Featherington wants Lady Featherington? Like, what? That part was so strange, and I was actually thinking that he was playing her, but no, he did seem to really want her. And then Eloise runs away from her own brother's wedding to see Theo, which was so annoying. Like I couldn't believe that she actually left her brother's wedding and I don't even think she went to see if he was okay with his runaway bride. She just left to go see some guy she had a crush on. So I thought that was super rude of her. And then there's a little bit of tension between Will Mondrich, who was the fighter from the previous season, who's now opened up his new club. He's given up his fighting. There's some tension between him and Lord Featherington with Will seeing through Jack's lies and Jack knowing about the deal that Will made with the previous Lord Featherington. I did like seeing Will again in the season but I will admit I missed the fighting from season one like the boxing. It was literally just a thirst trap but I missed it. I also teared up again in this episode. It was over Queen Charlotte and King George. I really love their story here. There's still so much love between them, even though King George has lost his mind and kind of forgotten a lot of things. He can't remember things correctly anymore, but he still remembers how much he loved Charlotte and my heart was just hurting for them. I really didn't expect to tear up and cry as much as I did in the season because I don't think I did at all in the previous season. So I will give props to that. Episode seven, these 
second to last episode is Harmony. The wedding has been called off, thank God, and the Sharmas and Bridgertons are trying to pretend that things are okay, trying to promenade, but people, the ton still snubs them. There are some consequences for Eloise running away to go see Theo when she was supposed to be at her brother's wedding. The queen now believes that Eloise is Lady Whistledown, so she threatens her, and both Eloise and Penelope are panicking now because they don't know what to do. Penelope makes a pretty bold choice to out Eloise and ruin her reputation in a Lady Whistledown column. I was actually pretty surprised she went through with it, but at the same time, there wasn't really anything else that Penelope could have done to save Eloise. And maybe I'm too harsh, but it honestly didn't seem that bad because Eloise was already such a rebel from the rest of society. She didn't want to be a part of the society anyway. So no one shows up to the ball that the Sharmas and the Bridgertons host because of what happened with Eloise, but I did love seeing the Bridgertons and Sharmas working together in this episode. They have this really sweet dance where everyone is just happy and loving even though no one showed up to the ball, but no one really cared. They had their families, they had the people that they loved the most, and they were happy about it. So I did love that moment, but I got quickly overshadowed by all the drama going on. And then just when I was thinking that there still wasn't any steam besides that one kiss, Kate and Anthony make love. I was very surprised that they actually made love before they got married, which was quite scandalous. I am sad to say though, this scene got ruined by how much heavy breathing there was. I still don't know why them arguing would lead them to breathe so heavily, but it was all that I was hearing. This heavy, heavy breathing. It was just way too noticeable and really took away my enjoyment from the actual scene. And I still can't believe that Anthony didn't even get naked for Kate in this episode. Like he got naked for other women in the beginning, but not Kate. And then another super strange thing was Anthony sniffing Kate. That really came out of nowhere. Like I don't remember them setting it up in the beginning of the season. I didn't actually have a problem with the whole sniffing thing. Like that was fine, but it was just the fact that it came out of nowhere. It felt so random. I mean, maybe I was missing something, but if Anthony talked about how good Kate smelled, like how much she smelled of lilies, then this sniffing scene wouldn't have been as random and as jarring. So if they set up the sniffing scene better, I would have been more than happy about it. And as if there wasn't enough drama, Anthony, when he goes to propose to Kate because they made love and he knows he's in love with her, Kate runs away. She runs away and ends up falling off of her horse and hitting her head and passing out. I just got so annoyed here because Kate isn't the kind of heroine, she isn't the kind of character who runs away from her problems, or at least she's not supposed to be. She's supposed to be this really headstrong girl who goes after what she wants. And I also way prefer the accident that happens in the book than in the show. Like in the book, Kate is riding with her sister or something and then the carriage that they're in tips over. So that's a carriage accident, Kate breaks her leg, and Anthony is panicking like crazy. But the thing about the scene in the book is that it was both funny and angsty, which I liked, but in the show it was just too gloomy. So there's a lot going on, a lot of drama, but I did at least appreciate that we were back to focusing more on Kate and Anthony. And then the final episode, episode 8, is named after the book, The Viscount Who Loved Me. I was really really bad for Anthony here, like he took on all the blame for Kate's accident. Like Jonathan Bailey did such a great job at portraying all of Anthony's heartache and pain. There's some really meaningful moments in this episode that I really enjoyed, like Violet talking with Anthony and telling him how she wouldn't change anything, even Edmund's death, because she had his love for so long. And this was pretty much her telling him that love is worth everything and that he can't give up on Kate. The other meaningful scene that I loved even more was Anthony and Gregory. We had the oldest Bridgerton son and the youngest Bridgerton son connecting. Anthony shared these really sweet memories of Edmund, of their father, to Gregory because he never got to experience them and you can see Anthony being such a great father figure in the scene. That was really sweet and heartwarming and then we also get another like swing set scene like there was in season one with Benedict and Eloise. They both talk about the imposter syndrome that they experience and it's a very relatable scene. I will say the show took her a little bit further than she was like in the books. Like she was still a bit of a rebel 
a sassy rebel in the books, but here she really, really goes against society. I didn't mind this though. The only thing I was annoyed by was the whole Theo thing. And then Kate, as much as I love her character, I was so tired of her because she's still running away. Even in the last episode, she's running away, going back home to India. Kate is one of my favorite characters in the books. I loved how strong and intelligent she is, how she spoke her mind, but in the show, she really seems to hide everything about her. She hides her feelings and gives up on everything that she wants, which is so disappointing to see. Kate and Anthony do have their final dance in this episode, and it's to Wrecking Ball of all songs. I think I mentioned it, but I didn't love Wrecking Ball as their final dance song. I feel like they could have chosen a more romantic song than Wrecking Ball, and I actually expected Wrecking Ball to be like for a scene where Kate was being her badass self. The dance was still good though, but I just wish that we got more of Anthony and Kate being together like this, like being happy together. We only get to see Kate and Anthony being together like this for like half an hour, the last half hour of the season. Like there's all this buildup and tension, which you do need in an enemies to lovers romance, but at the same time, I need a little bit more of the lovers part as well. And it just wasn't satisfying enough for me. So the romance is done, but we do still get some pretty big reveals in this final episode. Eloise finds out that Penelope is Lady Whistledown and the relationship, their friendship is broken over it. I don't actually remember Eloise making such a big deal in the books about finding out the truth about Penelope. But at the same time, I don't believe Penelope ruined Eloise's reputation either. But I did feel like the show really turned its character Characters into almost the worst versions of themselves. I get that this is supposed to be for drama, but I didn't actually want the show to turn into a historical drama, which it really seemed to do. I wanted it to stick to being a historical romance, like season one did a really great job at doing, but we just sadly lost the romance here. Another wildly different thing from the books that we got was Eloise's first heartbreak. She falls for Theo, which I'm still mad about for Philip. He breaks her heart though, because he knows that there can never really be anything between a Bridgerton lady and a lower class boy, which will be pretty interesting to explore because there is actually a book about a romance between two different classes, book three, an offer from a gentleman, which is Benedict's book, He Falls for a Servant Girl. I adore that book and I love that it's a Cinderella retelling, but I don't think that it's gonna be the next season. We have Penelope overhearing Colin saying that he would never court her. She's heartbroken over it and that's actually one of the few things that the show kept in the books. Sadly, Romancing Mr. Bridgerton is not really my favorite in the series. Like I like Colin and Penelope, but I don't love them, but I do know it is a lot of other people's favorite. I will say there's a plot outside of the romance that I surprisingly enjoyed. This is the Featherington story. I kind of love that Lady Featherington was actually able to outplay Lord Featherington. She was able to kick him out all the while keeping the money that they swindled out of people. She was a total mama bear here and even though she's not like a good character, she was a really compelling and interesting character and I was genuinely invested in her story. Ending the season with Pall Mall was a pretty good choice. We have the Bridgertons all together and bantering in their loving way. Like anytime the Bridgertons, or at least most of the Bridgertons, are all together in the same scene, I will more than likely love it. Though it did also end on a kind of awkward note because Anthony and Kate just start making out in front of their entire families. I was sad though, we never actually got a wedding for these two. We got this huge elaborate thing set up for Edwina and Anthony, but then we got nothing for Kate and Anthony. My overall thoughts for season two, it just didn't live up to my expectations. I didn't love it as much as I wanted to, and if I'm comparing it to season one, it definitely wasn't as good. The star of the show though truly was Newton the Corgi. He did such a good job looking cute on everyone's lap and making trouble for Anthony. I'm not happy about all these changes that they made from the books. Like the changes that they made felt so out of character. Not only did we not get the best scenes like the bee and boob sucking, they added all these unnecessary parts that I didn't enjoy. Like Edwina actually wanting Anthony and going all the way down the aisle to him. Like the book Edwina would never do that. She would never hurt Kate that way. So sad that we lost that sister friendship 
from the books. Instead, we get this super overbearing mother figure in Kate who becomes such a martyr, and that just wasn't enjoyable to watch. I also could have done without the Eloise and Theo plotline, Benedict and his art school, and also Will Mondrich's new club thing. As much as I love Eloise, Benedict, and Will, their plots didn't actually add that much to the season. They didn't do too much to add to their futures either, so I feel like instead of having such elaborate plots for them, the show could have instead focused more on Kate and Anthony. So if the show spent a little bit more time developing this romance, it could have been so much stronger. And that's also the reason why the season felt more like a historical drama than a historical romance. I feel like this is fine though for anyone who hasn't read the books or just doesn't care too much about romance, but as a romance reader, I didn't get the romance that I wanted. The season focused way too much on these external plots and with how much they change from the books, the season, the show is pretty much a whole different story. It's taken a life of its own and it's kind of given me Game of Thrones vibes, which is not the best because we all know how that ended. So at this point, I'm not really gonna hold out hope that they're gonna stick to the books, but at least now that I know they're not gonna stick to the books anymore, I can adjust my expectations and just enjoy the future seasons for what they end up being. I do wanna talk about some predictions for season three. Like for sure, we are getting Colin and Penelope next. We had so much build up, nothing at all for Benedict, so he's not happening yet. I'm kinda hoping we don't really get a glow up for Penelope, like she doesn't lose all her weight, like she does in the books. I want Colin to fall for her as she is, though I wouldn't mind like a glow up in terms of her wardrobe. I am curious if Penelope will give up being Lady Whistledown. It's such a central part to the show and it's like their entire marketing plan at this point, so I don't know if they would be able to give it up. I mean, I feel like if she does end up giving it up in the next season, someone else might take up the mantle. And then if we do get Colin and Penelope's romance next, I'm curious if we also get Francesca's and Eloise's because all three of these romances happen at the same time in the book series. This will probably mean less seasons, but I don't really expect them to have all eight seasons anyway, especially when it seems like season two isn't getting as much love as season one. I would love to see more of Francesca in the next season though. She probably gets the least screen time out of all the Bridgertons. And then for Eloise, if she does end up with Philip, if that's her end game in the show, which I really, really hope it is, that means some pretty bad things are in store for Marina. But that is pretty much all of my thoughts on Bridgerton season two, I'm giving it three out of five stars. Let me know what you think if you watched it. Did you love it or hate it? Are there any scenes that you loved or missed? seeing. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you all next time. Bye!